All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. And so again, um, welcome everybody. I'm Arne van Alstertjord and I'm the global head of the KCS Academy. And the, the Academy is the training and certification arm of the Consortium for Service Innovation. And welcome to our uh, KCS Aligned and Verified Vendor Series. And so in this series, you get to hear KCS best practices from experts from our aligned and verified vendors and often also their community. And for those not familiar with our KCS aligned and verified program, it's an elite group of tools that support the KCS practices. And in the case of our verified vendors, uh, they've demonstrated that they support all eight KCS practices and our aligned vendors are more specialized and they've proven that they support elements of the KCS methodology. And this webinar is sponsored by UX, and they're our newest uh, KCS uh, aligned vendor. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, Joe Jorsak. And Joe is the head of industry and uh, the general manager of the customer service and um, support solutions at UX. And Joe's gonna share how an effective knowledge strategy can address unique challenges associated with findability, as well as a discoverability. Um, but some housekeeping before we begin. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the KCS Academy site, as well as sent out to all who have registered. And this will be a public, so feel free to uh, forward it to anyone you'd like. But uh, during the presentation, please put yourself on mute and please put your, post your questions in chat. So Gordon Knapp from Yext, He's gonna be monitoring the chat and we'll either answer them in the chat or save them for the Q&A session at the end. And also wanna make sure you're aware of upcoming KCS Academy events. And Jennifer Mortcat, our community success manager is gonna be posting the link in the chat to our KCS Academy events page for all the upcoming events. And very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Joe. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, so I've been with Yex uh, for about a year, but I've been in the customer service and support space for 20 plus years. Worked with large organizations like IBM, which is where I had my introduction to KCS, uh, where I was managing all, all of our community and knowledge management um, teams uh, relative to our uh, IBM consulting. Uh, massive challenge, uh, great introduction to all of the intricacies and nuances and impact of uh, really what KCS enables. Um, have carried that over into work with uh, Oracle. Uh, most recently, I came to uh, Yext from some time at Zendesk, as well as Medallia. So really, I'm a deep um, aficionado and, and adherent of really creating um, very intentional customer experiences, customer journey mapping, and then also thinking about all the different touch points where you can impact uh, better experiences. So uh, with that, um, I will jump ahead and give you a little bit of background about who Yext is. Uh, so Yext has been around since 2006. Uh, we are publicly traded. Uh, we've been in this space uh, really from a starting in the marketing domain. Uh, and our area was thinking about how do we create uh, really brand verified facts that are available everywhere somebody looks for them. Uh, on the basis of that start, uh, we started building this capability of how do we manage information. And so we have now through uh, the um, underlying solutions and products that we've developed, uh, have the ability to work with um, thousands of companies and brands, really managing um, all kinds of facts, information, but also making that information accessible. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through uh, the session today. Uh, but we are a global company headquartered in New York City. If by chance you're in the Chelsea uh, neighborhood, we'd love to have you come by. Um, and uh, we continue to grow in this space. And we're excited to be part of the consortium uh, and to attain the um, KCS Align designation. So we'll continue to grow in this space. So our agenda for today, uh, we're going to talk about the KM landscape, some of the challenges that we have. I know everybody on this call uh, lives and breathes this every day. So we're uh, hoping to bring some unique perspectives to the conversation, talk a little bit about the, uh, the challenges and the, the nuances of what findability and discoverability means. Uh, we'll talk about some best practices for accomplishing both. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about what YEX delivers, and then we'll leave time at the end for Q&A. So it's interesting today, uh, as I was thinking about, you know, this audience, uh, how skilled and how experienced you all are. Um, and, you know, we get so embedded um, in thinking about information and knowledge and how do we organize information. Um, and as I kind of um, take a step back and put my customer hat on, 
or my user hat on. I think about it almost like the treasure hunt. Um, and, you know, you think about, I have a question, I need to find answers to something. And, you know, it's almost like I've got dozens and dozens of boxes or doors in front of me. Um, and I know that there's valuable information in each one of those doors um, and each one of those boxes. Which one do I open first? You know, what do I, um, how do I think, you know, which one might have the right information? Uh, and a lot of times it's a pretty linear process, right? I have to open one, look in, see if that answers the question. If not, close it up and go try somewhere else. Uh, it's compounded by the fact that I've also got these other questions that are kind of in the back of my mind. You know, in addition to where should I start, do I trust the source? Do I trust the information that I'm seeing in there? And as I look at this huge stack of boxes, how long is this going to take me? Um, and so in many cases, I don't have a lot of time. Um, you know, I'm not spending an hour or two uh, to just go ahead and poke around and see what's there. I'm trying to find an answer to a question. Um, and that's been a huge challenge for a lot of folks because today, uh, knowledge bases and information sources are everywhere, um, but they're often not designed for quick answers. There's a, an aphorism that's uh, been around for a while. I first uh, heard this when I was working at IBM. Um, I think it was mistakenly attributed to Samuel Johnson, the uh, author from, I think, the 1600s. Uh, but uh, I think the, uh, the gist of it is definitely relevant, and I've uh, slightly adapted it here. Uh, so, you know, as we think about, you know, not only knowing where to find something, but also how to find something today. Um, and the how part has changed dramatically. Um, it's interesting uh, when I encounter you know, new colleagues who come on board or when I work with uh, agent teams and they're thinking about onboarding new agents, um, the amount of information that you have to consume and be able to navigate and find um, is staggering. Um, and it's interesting that you know, for the most part, what people start doing is they start creating bookmarks or uh, notes or lists or cheat sheets. Uh, and so they're trying to think about different ways to, um, you know, try to organize the information in their mind and kind of build that mental model of where things are, or even a physical model. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is that those underlying data sources um, continue to grow in volume and variety. And, you know, it just it's a challenge sometimes to even keep track of where was that bookmark that I made. So uh, how to find things is really the big opportunity. And really what this is a reflective of is, you know, as people become more attuned to, uh, you know, use leveraging Search technologies, it's that search element um, that comes into play um, and figuring out not just how to organize it, but then how to navigate and, and um, really pinpoint that piece of information that I want. Um, a few stats that we'll, we'll um, share here. So, right, this is around the idea of uh, self-service and you know, people want to help themselves. Uh, what's interesting uh, when we think about, and we'll talk about in a moment, uh, the power of Google, right? So Google has really altered fundamentally a lot of uh, how people think about search, you know, where they go to find information. Um, I've seen different stats. Um, I've seen everywhere from 40% of all searches start on Google. I've even seen north of uh, 80%. Uh, if we go with a more conservative view, we'll say that 40% of searches uh, start on Google. Um, that means that, you know, the remainder are coming right to your um, online resources. And so, you know, people are directly um, accessing those uh, resources, that content to try to find answers to the questions that they have. That's also interesting today, um, you know, where especially, again, as we have digital natives, you know, the younger cohorts that are coming up, um, you know, they're not accustomed to wanting to pick up a phone. You know, maybe they'll do a chat, but more likely they just want to leverage the digital resources that are available and try to find answers on their own. You know, it's not their first inclination is not to make a call, but it's really to see, can I get this done without having to contact anybody? Um, and then the last that that I've uh, highlighted here. Uh, and this is something that we've seen, um, you know, through our own experience is that, you know, a lot of the live support volume, it could actually be handled in self-service channels. And this is one of the biggest frustrations for a lot of agents and support leaders. Um, the 40% number, again, is also conservative. Uh, talking with Arnfin and the teams, we know that in a lot of the experience uh, that KCS members have, actually, it could be in the north of 80%. Um, regardless of where the number is in between there, we know that a lot of the volume that comes in that the answers to those questions are out there. And uh, the challenge is that people can't find it or they can't find it quickly. Uh, and so they end up going through the, the more um, uh, expensive channel of a direct contact. Um, again, as we set the landscape for the KM challenge, uh, just a couple more slides. One of the just share, you know, this idea of these journeys, right? And I think everybody's been talking about, um, you know, started out with multi-channel and then it was cross-channel and then omni-channel. Uh, and we know that consumers and customers, they'll take different kinds of paths for different kinds of questions. Um, and a lot of it also depends on how they think about that challenge. So there is no one path that's going to be consistent for all personas even. 
Um, everybody's going to have a unique perspective um, on what they're trying to accomplish and kind of what their background is. Uh, and so the challenge is that, you know, while we've been talking about cross-channel and omni-channel for, gosh, it seems like almost 10 years now, um, a lot of companies are still stuck at multi-channel and the thinking of, well, I've got all these different channels. I've got now messaging channels. I've got obviously chat or chat bots, and I've got self-service that that's sufficient. And it really isn't. When we think about what people are doing today, uh, again, almost always, uh, you know, searches start, especially if it's a uh, kind of a general question, it'll start with a search engine. This starts with Google. Um, if it is for a specific brand or an, um, an, an engagement that's already in flight, uh, you might go directly to the brand site. But on the Google search, it's interesting. You get a lot of content, right, that Google or Apple or Microsoft have indexed. Uh, and that could be a whole wealth of information, right, in terms of expert sites, YouTube videos, all different kinds of resources. Um, Google has done a phenomenal job of building an engine that is uh, incredibly um, good at monetizing that interaction. Uh, I think I saw the Q4 numbers uh, for their revenue. They were at 75 billion, uh, which is a staggering sum. Uh, and so, you know, they have been able to do that because of all this core investment um, in the search experience. Um, and they've done an amazing job of delivering those resources. Um, invariably, you'll come to the, your brand's website. Um, and so you might get there directly. You might get there from a referral link um, from a Google search. Uh, but what's often the challenge, and you can see I've structured the results more linearly. Uh, and so from a, a linear perspective, you have all these different uh, you know, sections and categories and pages and uh, a lot of content that's nested deep down. And so you have to start to now do this, again, almost a treasure hunt. Uh, which section do I start with? Where do I look? Um, if I have a help question, often I'm dropping all the way to the bottom of the page to see if, you know, is there a, a help center? Because it's not easy to find sometimes. Um, or I might even just see that there's a 1-800 number listed. So you have all of these different options that are posted. Um, and from a self-service experience, if I really want to just jump in and try to find that help center and figure out what do I, um, uh, what can I access to address that question? Again, I'm met with a wealth of content. Um, sometimes that content is beautifully designed, um, very thoughtfully arranged, but it may not be arranged in the way that I'm thinking about the problem. Or if I haven't thought about you know exactly what uh, my answer would be, then I have to start opening up every box and looking inside that box to see if it answers my question. It takes time to do that and work my way through. And invariably what happens is, um, you know, I probably run into, a, uh, I, if I can't find what I'm looking for, I, I stumble into a, you know, a situation where I need to get a handoff to an agent assisted help. Uh, we talk about with customers that you really, when you have these kind of long drawn out ex, uh, explorations, two things happen. One, people get frustrated. And in many cases, they just bounce back to Google. And we call that the most expensive click because you've now lost control of the experience. The other one is the uh, most expensive channel, right? Where I picked up the phone, that's gonna be an expensive call. Um, and it may not, hopefully it will be resolved in one, one uh, engagement, but often isn't. On the uh, flip side of that equation, you have the agent experience. Um, you know, companies are dealing with, you know, hundreds, thousands, uh, sometimes more uh, tickets coming in per month. Um, and the challenge is that those consumers, they want immediate responses. And so with that kind of volume coming in, um, you know, that's going to be a huge challenge. Agents have a ton of responsibility um, and they have to do things very quickly in terms of reviewing and triaging and identifying previous responses, um, composing a response, you know, uh, then typing up those notes, managing the ticket disposition. Uh, and for them, especially if you're a new agent, it's super hard, right? Because there is so much content behind the scenes. It is not uncommon for agents to have, you know, 10, 15, 20 different tabs open, different resources that they have to access. Um, in many cases, every one of those resources may have their own search experience. Um, and so it becomes really challenging and difficult for agents to get that information they need to be able to answer the question the way the, uh, the customer wants it. Um, and then to be able to meet all of the expectations of the business to be a good brand ambassador. So, you know, that's why we're seeing this massive um, turnover in agents. It's hard to find them. It's hard to keep them. It's hard to get them to a point of efficiency. So that brings us to our theme for today. Uh, we'll talk about these concepts of findability and discoverability. Um, you know, at first glance, they sound almost synonymous. Um, and you think about, well, if I'm finding something, I'm discovering something, it's, uh, it sounds pretty similar. Uh, there is a nuance and there's an important nuance here. Um, and when we think about findability, um, and I think as we go through the examples, it'll start to settle in, but the idea of finding known data, like you know that it's out there, how can I get to it directly, quickly? Um, and in many cases that's using uh, search or could be using browse. The concept of discoverability is more of how do I encounter new information? 
I wasn't explicitly looking for it, but it was delivered to me in the context of my engagement. Um, so the pro tip is that both of these elements are important. You can't ignore them. Uh, one is, you know, the ability to have something be findable is really valuable, but also, you know, as people are engaging with content to have new information and additional resources be discoverable is equally important. Uh, to give you a little bit of a context of what this could look like, um, I think the, uh, the book example uh, is a good one. So if I think about Amazon and Game of Thrones, you know, this is all about findability. You know, I'm, I'm a, a J.R.R. Martin fan. Uh, and so if I come to Amazon, you know, typically my experience is I go directly to that search bar. I'm not going through sections and categories and browsing you know, the fantasy libraries of all the different authors. I'm going right to Game of Thrones. Um, now, when I get there, obviously, Amazon is trying to do as much as they can to entice me with these other things, right? Do I want to get the, the box set? Do I want to get the, uh, the videos, et cetera? Um, but for the most part, my Amazon experience, and yours might be different, but my Amazon experience is I'm looking for something very specific, and I go straight there. Um, I might filter that search down, right, because I want to get Amazon Prime, but you know, I want to be able to know I can get that really quickly. Now, Amazon may also then offer additional information. Hey, if you like J.R.R. Martin, you might also like these other titles. Um, sometimes I'm interested, usually not. Uh, the flip side of that is if I go into Barnes and Noble, um, and unfortunately most of these stores uh, have gone by the wayside, there are still a handful out there. Uh, and there are other bookstores, of course, that are now coming, coming back um, to take their place. Uh, but this might be a familiar view, right? Where you uh, walk into a bookstore and it's, I uh, mentioned it because I used to work at Barnes and Noble early in my career. Um, and it was a, an amazing experience. Um, you're presented with 30,000 square feet, um, 100,000 titles, uh, so much uh, to look at and browse. And you, know, you might have a, a reason to go to the store to find a particular title, but invariably you get to that section, that category, that, that shelf, um, and you start looking around. You kind of like, what else is next to it? What other topics was I kind of in the back of my mind were, uh, were peaked? Do I go over to the magazine rack or do I go over to uh, kind of the new releases? And so this idea of discoverability is really important that, you know, I can surface additional content. So let's drill in a little bit about findability in the support context. Um, and so when we think about, you know, looking for known data, known information, how do I do that? So when we think about findability, there's two elements to it. We think about third party findability. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of searches, whether it's 40% or 80% or more uh, that start on search engines. Um, that's going to be a very common approach. Um, and so a lot of people just by default will go there. Others will have different patterns. But either way, it's an important element to factor in. When we think about, you know, how do you get to your help site? A lot often it's from that referral link. It's from that third party search. Um, and we know that millennials and, you know, all the cohorts that are coming up, they are even more inclined um, to do that. They become masters of using search as they go through all of their schooling. And so the idea is that you want to make all of that content easily accessible on Google, on those third party search sites. Um, and that's something that Yext has become extremely uh, proficient in. That's where we started our business, was making uh, a user's or a company's brand verified information easily accessible, no matter where people searched. Uh, so we can do that through a number of ways. Um, obviously, a key part of that is making your content search engine optimized. Um, we have a number of things that revolve around pages and um, you know, being able to use schema markup to be able to you know, present content in a way that makes it easy for Google to, to consume. But the benefits of doing this is that, one, uh, when you're presenting that information, you know that it's your content that's rising to the top. Um, you're not going to get a third party. You, um, you know, sometimes I do a search and I see uh, like a small mom and pop shop, which that's fine, uh, but they're probably not the, the company that you want representing your brand or your product. You want your information to be easily accessible, directly available, um, and really consumable. Uh, you can also use that to acquire more traffic, right? So that's where you're bringing in information um, and, and bringing in those, those visits from Google. Um, and that's really then where you can start to shape the experience. Um, and chances are, if somebody is searching for something, it could be a more general search. So if it's something like near me or how do I in this area, um, you know, then you can start to find people who are really inclined to actually convert, right? And to be able to um, engage with the brand. Um, another element of findability is first party findability. So when they do finally come to your site, um, you want to make sure that, you know, when you are, are engaging in that self-service experience, that they can find content easily and quickly. The, um, uh, in many cases, it's uh, today a navigation-driven model. Um, and navigation is fine, uh, but in many cases, uh, it misses the mark. Because, again, you have to open those different boxes, um, poke into each of those different areas to see if I can get an answer to my question. Um, and that can be time-consuming. Uh, in many cases, it's taking that same Google-like search experience, bringing it to your site, um, and being able to ask a straightforward question and get a direct answer back. 
Um, a number of benefits come from this as well, right? These direct answers uh, really enable people to get that nugget of information that they need um, and then be able to move about their day, right? And then, um, you know, they have confidence in the answers that they're getting uh, and also confidence in the brand experience, right? That you're, you're treasuring and valuing their time. Uh, when we think about that uh, ability to bring content in from all different parts of the organization, key element there as well. So you don't have to poke into all those different sites or subdomains or uh, different resources to get the answer. Um, and then, of course, you can um, you know, learn from that, right? Uh, one of the really interesting things about this uh, first party findability and accessing this search um, is the idea that you know, you're getting the direct questions that people are answering. There's a lot of information you can understand about what users are seeing and feeling from those inputs. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, I mentioned down below um, some of these integrations. Uh, we also have uh, a number of different connectors uh, to make these processes easier. Um, and we'll share that as, uh, as we go forward. Um, one example of first party findability is around Samsung. Uh, so they are a um, uh, obviously a massive organization with thousands of different products and solutions. Um, we've got a screen gift here and I can show you a live example in a moment. Uh, Samsung in 2020, uh, as COVID was really you know, taking root and really impacting people and they were starting to work from home, uh, school from home, a uh, huge amount of challenge. Samsung was overloaded, inundated with support requests because people were coming to their site and it was a beautifully designed site, but there was so much information um, and it was hard for people to find what they wanted. And they ended up just making calls to the call center to be able to get answers to their questions. Uh, Samsung was working with a different uh, search provider. It was really cumbersome to use. It was a... Uh, uh, I would say developer centric, they had to get in line with the development team to make any changes. They wanted to be able to iterate faster and they weren't able to do that. So uh, Samsung worked with Yext, uh, chose Yext and we worked with them to build a, a new search experience. And uh, we basically used our connector framework, connected 2,500 different pieces of backend content, articles, videos, et cetera. Um, and we were able to implement this experience with them in less than two months. And within two months of going live, uh, they realized some really phenomenal results. And we've got those highlighted on the left. Uh, but the ability for them to be able to get better engagement with their health content was really um, critical. The, they were able to take advantage of uh, really improved um, promotions and promoted content. Um, and the click-through rates uh, increased dramatically. They, they had a 200% improvement on promoted content, click-through rate on promoted content. Um, and you know, their CTR, um, sorry, their CTAs overall uh, better um, improvement by 40%. So massive improvement for Samsung uh, to be able to help users not only um, get answers to their questions, but also feel more connected to the brand. And uh, I'll give you one example of what that looks like in action. So if I come here to the Samsung page, uh, there's a few interesting things that are happening here. Uh, when we think about uh, you know, how do people engage with search, Samsung really wanted to take a new approach rather than keeping the search bar kind of buried in the header or in the footer or kind of off to the side, they wanted to take a front and center approach, very Google-esque. Um, and the idea was that make it um, obvious that this is the best way to engage with the content. You can also see they have an animation uh, running, right? So it's scrolling through, offering users the different kinds of questions they can ask. You know, what are the things that I'm really good at resolving? And showing them that it doesn't have to be a keyword-based approach. You can ask, ask a question in natural language and you can get a really powerful response back. Um, so I'll give you one example here. Um, so how do I clean my microwave? Because uh, this is a common question. You leave something in the microwave, it explodes all over. What do I do? Um, and so now Samsung um, has uh, really uh, enabled users to find that direct piece of information. Um, and what we've done in, in Google, or um, uh, sorry, a Google-like experience is we've indexed all of that content. Uh, we've ingested all of that into our knowledge graph scanned all of it. And now when somebody asks that, that question in natural language, we're able to understand the intent of that question and not just present a link back, but more importantly, find that nugget of information um, and deliver that back in the form of a direct answer. Again, this is really when I ask somebody a question, I don't want them to tell me, well, here are five or six sources to go answer, uh, to go resolve that. If you know the answer, just tell me what it is. Samsung knows the answer and they're able to tell me what it is. Uh, so one other example before we jump into discoverability. So we talked about the idea of, um, uh, or actually, no, we'll go ahead into discoverability. So when I think about, um, you know, how do I encounter information that was not explicitly sought out? So external discoverability, um, key element here is, you know, decreasing um, case creation. So uh, if I am going through the process of trying to figure out how do I resolve an issue um, and I have a case form that's presented to me, 
Um, you know, one of the things we've again already pointed out is that a lot of those those contacts, those requests, could be resolved, um, you know, through the the case form experience. Um, and so, one of the things that we want to be able to do is, you know, at that moment of need, somebody is to say, "Hey, I need to submit a, a support request," uh, and I want to be able to, you know, submit my my ticket, my case, get an answer to that question. Can we actually, I would say, intercept um, that experience and be able to find that piece of information that they need, and then be able to do that right there? Um, so uh, an example of what that would look like uh, if I'm over here on uh, outreach. So again, we talked about the idea of, um, so findability. So how do I import to CRM? Um, so here's a great example of you know, that previous concept of findability. So I've added, asked a direct question. Um, I wanna be able to find information about that. And I can see a really well-composed, easy to consume piece of information. Um, it's not just the link, it's actually like an animated GIF that gives me the instructions on how to do something. Really powerful experience. But say I still need to contact um, outreach uh, and you know, be able to ask a question on a different topic. So I come over to their submit a request form. And so in this case, um, again, this is a standard Zendesk form, uh, you know, similar approach with ServiceNow and, and Freshdesk and Salesforce as well. Uh, but the idea of that, I've got this web form, I've got some fields that I've required. These can be conditional fields, obviously it can be designed the way you want. Uh, but I can pick from a number of items. Um, so if I do troubleshooting, I can add my address. Um, and if I come down here to a, a product area uh, and I can see again, different information can be surfaced as I go. We can queue this automatic search off of different fields. Um, and obviously it can be designed in different ways. Uh, but if I have account information, right? I can automatically connect the user with information about those types of articles. Um, I can even you know, connect into different information, whether it's around courses or webinars, different ways that I can leverage that. What's also interesting is now that I've presented this search experience, and we say, oh, okay, actually, actually what I'm looking for is, you know, how do I lock a, and there it is, it types ahead, right? So how do I lock a user seat? And again, the answer is delivered in a knowledge snippet right there. The idea is that you want to make it really simple to resolve that question, um, you know, and I've got additional content that could be um, uh, uh, relevant in that context. So again, it's that idea of you have this discoverability element that complements the findability. Uh, from an internal discoverability, uh, when we think about internal, this is you know for the agent. So agents, again, are all also living and breathing inside of these support platforms, whether it's a Zendesk or a Salesforce or, or, or others. You know, and they are responding to all sorts of questions. And typically when a case comes in or their call comes in, it may be one specific thing, but often it's you know two or three topics that they're trying to resolve. Um, and we know that you know for knowledge workers and agents as well, you know twenty percent of their time is spent just trying to understand and, and find information. Um, that's a huge amount of money um, spent, time spent, which equates into money uh, invested into that experience. Um, the idea is that you want to make it really easy for agents to find that content quickly, um, be able to have confidence in the information that they're accessing, um, and feel good about the, the support that they're delivering to customers. So an example of what that can look like. So if I come over here to you know, an agent desktop, um, and this again, very familiar space, uh, I'll give you a, this is a demo environment. So it'll be a, a pretty rudimentary, obviously Zendesk and Salesforce uh, service cloud environments can be highly customized, but this will give you the example. So if I come over here as an agent, I open a uh, ticket. Um, and so automatically, as soon as the agent has opened this, I've already had the search um, executed. And I've got information that's available to the agent that they can then start to um, leverage that to be able to resolve the issue. What's also interesting here is I've got lots of other content that's being connected into the agent desktop. So I don't have to go into a uh, different tab or a different platform for community post information or to find location information or to find information about products. All of that is surfaced right inside that search experience. So from an agent discoverability perspective, all of that is right at my fingertips. And so if I ask different questions in the search experience, it's delivered right to me. Um, so again, really powerful in terms of helping agents be more efficient and effective in their role. And this is especially important when you think about newer agents you know, who have, again, built up that institutional knowledge or that experience, that pattern recognition, um, and to be able to know where things are. But even for experienced agents, like I said con before, content is constantly changing. There are new, new, there's new information, new releases, new updates that need to be, they need to be made aware of. Um, and given the volume of information that's being delivered, 
Uh, it's not expected that, you know, they'll be able to keep all of that in their mind or even keep their bookmark list current uh, and their, their kind of their cheat sheets current. So you really need to do it in this kind of context where it's in their environment, at their fingertips, always available um, and easily uh, deployable. Uh, so I shared the outreach example. So a few key considerations um, as we move forward. One of the important elements to look at um, is, you know, the idea of collecting all this information. How do you leverage it to really create a better experience overall? Um, you know, we talk about the idea of search being a uh, unfiltered voice of customer capability. So as people engage with the content, um, they're obviously getting a lot of, um, of signals. You know, what content is being accessed? How do they respond to that information? You know, are they looking at content but still submitting tickets? So you want to collect all that information, but you also want to collect the, um, the verbatims themselves, right? What people are actually typing into those search bars, because um, there's a lot of information, um, actionable information from that. Obviously, being able to analyze all of that feedback, um, you know, being able to do things like clustering and sentiment analysis. And I'll give you an example of this in a moment. Um, and, you know, what kinds of uh, questions are we able to deliver direct answers for? Can give you a really good indicator of where do you need to either improve information um, or where do you need to be able to uh, create new information or remove process or friction gaps. It's important to know that, you know, you don't want to have customers have to repeat themselves. Um, and if they keep coming back with the same questions uh, or they have to, you know, like a transfer from a self-service to an agent assistant experience and have to repeat themselves, you know, that's not what you want. You want to be able to know that we've heard them, that we've included and incorporated their knowledge and their experience into the overall uh, delivery and that we can do a better job in terms of servicing that right answer next time. So um, an example of what that can look like. So as we look at, um, and this is a little bit of a back-end view of our knowledge graph. Um, and we'll talk about a knowledge graph in a moment, but the idea is that you wanna bring in all of this information into one place. Uh, you have content that sits in all those different backends. You know, as I showed on that agent experience, you'll have information that sits in uh, video repositories and SharePoint uh, document bases, and it could be in Box and Dropbox. It could be in um, you know, different knowledge management systems or systems of record and transactional systems. All of that information is critical um, to be able to help agents be better um, and help customers get um, easier answers. Um, learning from all of that information is equally critical. So the ability to come in, understand what kind of search analytics you're getting, um, where is the knowledge graph, our underlying engine, able to deliver results to questions that are being posed? Um, how many people are clicking through on those results? Um, you know, what uh, promotions and CTAs are driving the most value? Um, you know, you can also look at as you rank and re-rank, um, you know, uh, results. How can you improve that as well? There's a ton of capability through our uh, search platform, uh, our Knowledge Graph platform that we can share. Uh, and we'll mention at the end, if you'd like to do a, um, a deep dive one-on-one, -on -one, we're happy to do that for you as well. Uh, the other element over here is in our answers experience. Um, and we think about the idea of, um, you know, search term clustering. Um, and if I look at the, um, the ability to look at all of the, the content and, um, you know, what does that look like from a cost savings perspective? What am I doing from, you know, in, uh, the ability to drive more conversions or better value from the investments that we're making? You know, a lot of that information is really not easily accessible. Um, in many cases, the challenge is that, um, you know, the uh, the native search platforms don't capture this, um, you know, their native search uh, windows. And so you want to be able to pull this again, all from a cross um, cross information or cross knowledge based perspective. So uh, that's just a little peek behind the curtain into our knowledge graph that really makes this happen. And uh, let me just talk about that again, a little bit more because um, it's a concept that not everybody's familiar with. So a knowledge graph, um, and this is really what makes Yext unique. A uh, knowledge graph was an idea that was uh, really first brought to light early in the internet, I think it was in the 2000 timeframe. Um, and you had Tim Berners-Lee uh, who brought uh, the concept to light. Um, Google really uh, took hold of this and popularized it um, through their deployment of a knowledge graph in the 2010, 2012 timeframe. Um, and if you look at old Google, uh, you know a lot of it was kind of at its initiation, um, a keyword search experience. Um, yes, they had page, page rank, uh, but the results were often delivered in the form of links. Um, it wasn't really around the, until the 2012 timeframe that that shifted. Um, and you got to see really all of that uh, sophistication and, um, and nuance in terms of how Google delivers search results. And that's all enabled by a knowledge graph. Um, and what's interesting about a knowledge graph is not only does it collect all the information that you have, um, and, but it also understands the relationships between that information. And that's really what enables those natural language questions to happen and the ability to get those direct answers back. 
And so the knowledge graph is really that key element of um, how you're going to be able to deliver a better support experience through the better search experiences, again, both on-site, off-site, and for first-party um, and third-party findability and discoverability. So to bring it all together um, from a uh, discoverability and findability perspective, key element, meet customers where they are. You want to make sure that um, they don't have to hunt and search for information, um, that it should be easy to find from one consistent universal search experience. Don't make that search experience hard to find either. You know, in many cases, uh, we see you know, multiple search experiences living on the same page. It's confusing and um, really dis, uh, inc incongruous for customers and users to wonder like, well, which one should I use? Um, and so you know, it's bringing the support teams and the marketing teams together to agree on, hey, this is a strategy that's going to actually help not only the support experience, but the brand experience overall. Um, and make that search experience ubiquitous, um, universal, and easy to, to, um, to leverage. Uh, you take advantage of natural language processing and the analytics uh, to reduce effort. You know, just as we showed before, you know, the idea that you have all of this information that's there, you have to leverage that information. Um, let people ask questions in natural language. Um, you, know, you don't have to um, you know, focus on synonyms and keywords. Um, let the AI and the ML models do what they do best to be able to understand the context of those questions, the intent of those questions, and be able to deliver the best answers overall. Um, and then learn from those experiences to be able to continue to fine tune uh, the experience and the content that people are looking for. Um, and then the last piece, again, is organizing it all in one place. Leverage that knowledge graph capability. Um, you can certainly have disparate systems. We're not saying that you need to get rid of all those or migrate into one. In many cases, all the different knowledge-based platforms that are out there, uh, all the different systems of record, those are all important for different facets of the business. Uh, and so, but the objective is how do you connect and tap into all of those uh, disparate systems? into one experience and where you can make that uh, information easily accessible, searchable, applicable, um, and then, of course, learn from that. So that would be our guidance uh, to the folks listening today. Uh, a little bit about Yext and how we enable those experiences. Uh, when we think about all of these different touch points, as I mentioned before, it's around how do you reduce the number of inbound support requests? It's not about deflection because that sounds like you're pushing somebody off. It's more about enabling them to answer their own questions and ideally, right, not have to force them to go into that um, agent-assisted care uh, route. But you know, when they, and for, to do that, you want to focus on SEO for help center content, make it easy to find that content on third-party part, third search engines. This is where Yext was born. We have a tremendous amount of capability in this space, um, and it's often an area that's overlooked. Uh, when we think about in-app support for companies that do have a mobile app experience, again, it's so interesting as you work with uh, mobile apps, and you, you know, sometimes it's hard to find. You have to go through the, the hamburger menu and look for the support button uh, or link and you click on it. And next thing you know, it takes you out of the app. It opens up your mobile browser. And now you've got to go through that same clunky disconnected search experience or, or navigation experience on, uh, on a mobile device. Um, and it really doesn't work. The idea is you want to bring content directly into the app uh, that's relevant and contextual and you know, easily consumable. So you don't have to disrupt that experience. So we enable that capability as well. When we think about help site search portals, um, uh, portal search, the idea is that you want to make it easy um, for anybody who comes to your site, whether it's your landing page, your homepage, or your dedicated help portal. Make it easy to find that information. And of course, at that moment of need, if somebody says, I still you know, I haven't been able to find what I want, I'm going to submit a case. Um, you know, they, they hit the contact us button. You know, be able to anticipate and intercept that request. You know, be able to understand the, now you have more intent uh, or uh, understanding of the intent of the question. Uh, be able to deliver that piece of information that addresses that, hopefully give them the answers they need before they have to wait for a response. Um, and we do know that in many cases, the support teams are a critical piece of the equation. Um, and we're not saying that you want to minimize that at all. You have, if anything, you want to put extra effort on making that agent-assisted experience really powerful and compelling. So for that agent desktop search, make it easy for agents to do what they want to do already as consumers, leverage that search experience, make it easily accessible and available. Um, and then, of course, resolve those cases and those tickets as quickly as possible, uh, but also accurately. You don't want to have any kind of either um, uh, escalation or a redirect or a reopen. Uh, you know, those are experiences that nobody enjoys. And so you want to have that resolution um, be done really efficiently and then learn from it. Of course, all of this is built on the knowledge graph. Uh, the key thing of this is that every company that works with Yax gets their own knowledge graph. So you're not relying on one you know, back end that's trying to serve everybody. You get your own instance of it. So it's your own information um, and the relationships between your information. Um, and that way you're able to really shape that experience across all of these different touch points. 
Um, so when I look at how we bring all of this together, um, you know, it's collecting all of this content, this information, it's organizing it uh, together in this knowledge graph um, uh, approach, you know, being able to deploy this uh, really across the business and then, you know, being able to deliver those answers in multiple locations. Uh, and the key thing to keep in mind is that this is a um, really a business user centered platform. Uh, this is not something that your development team or consultants have to come in and manage. Uh, I'll give you the Samsung example earlier. Most of our customers are up and running within a couple of months. Uh, you could even be done in a couple of days um, if it's if the data sources are more collected in one space. Um, but for the most part, you know, we are able to deploy a really robust, rich search experience um, with a uh, all of the connections and integrations uh, because of the backend capabilities that we built. And then we're able to deploy that in lots of different places. So again, massive benefit, huge time, um, time to value improvements. Um, and we're seeing payback periods, you know, in the order of uh, months on the investment. Uh, last couple of slides, again, just about Yext, we're working with uh, all of the leading support platforms and in our integrations and connectors continue to grow. So Salesforce, Zendesk, uh, Freshworks, and ServiceNow, obviously leading platforms in the space, but we are continuing to build others. Uh, so as we look at you know, how the uh, support and the knowledge management ecosystems continue to grow and evolve, the idea is we want to make it easy to connect all of that backend information, uh, no matter where it lives, bring it into the graph, and then really be able to take better advantage of all of the investments that you already have. Um, and then to wrap it up, again, we've been in this space for since 2006 for a long time, working with all kinds of brands um, to help deliver better answers, experiences, better um, search experiences across the board. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I think we'll turn it over now for Q&A. And uh, thanks, Joe. And Gordon, do you have any, I know you're doing a great job of answering questions in the chat. Any questions that you want to bring up to Joe? Sure. Yeah. I think one that would be interesting to, to walk through, Joe, is um, whether or not you can see analytics within the, the agent dashboard so you can kind of know what the customers were looking at before they they came to support like submitted ticket because we we all know that customers shouldn't have to re repeat themselves in an ideal world yeah um so we do have the concept of obviously roles and different types of personas uh, there's a lot of flexibility for different kinds of deployments um, and so if you want to have uh, frontline agents be able to access the graph uh, you can certainly do that um, one of the ways that we think about um, you know when we started out in the marketing space and you have brand verified information uh, you may have, for instance, a, um, a franchise. So you could have hundreds or even thousands of locations, and you might want to have the individual owners of those locations be able to keep their information current. Um, and so we have the ability to let that happen. So you don't have you know, a, a user who may be out in a specific location accessing all of the information in the graph. You can kind of restrict their view. The same approach can be applied to an agent so they can actually see more of the um, experience. In terms of deploying uh, the search experience, in terms of deploying uh, the analytics directly with inside of the agent interface. That's something that we're exploring. Uh, we try to keep the, the experience as I would say as intuitive and as streamlined as possible. Um, you know, the ability to bring in search history though is something that is definitely doable. So if you want to be able to see what a user has looked at before they've um, started that ticket or opened that case, uh, and you know what of the resources that they've already investigated that didn't meet the need, uh, the agent has that information available. So it is part of the integration that you'll see on the sidebar. And I will uh, underscore Gordon, put the link to Knowledge Graphs. You have some great training on the Knowledge Graphs and very, very, very interesting topic. You also mentioned uh, ensuring that your um, content is being highlighted on Google and you shared, um, at least with me in pre-meeting, the schema.org, you mind? Yeah. Is that, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is it no, no. tools that they can be used? Absolutely. So schema.org is, a, uh, and it's available to anybody uh, who goes there. Um, the idea is that you want to be able to understand what are all the elements that um, a search engine like Google is looking for in terms of how they want to be able to consume content and format it so it can be easily deployed. Uh, one of the things that we do through Yaxt uh, with our pages uh, product, and it's, uh, I think, a key element that, again, is sometimes overlooked in the support experience, is how do you organize that content to be able to make it consumable offline uh, or, uh, sorry, offsite? And so um, schema.org is a uh, really a template and, a, and a, an approach that we leverage. Um, and it's a way to make sure that as you're constructing those pages, that you're incor incorporating all of the key elements um, that would be required for that offsite, offsite or, or third-party search findability perspective. 
So uh, it's something that we can certainly dive into more and we can drop into the um, into the chat as well. I think if you want to dive in uh, or dig into that topic a little bit deeper. Um, I see the question around nonprofit pricing. Um, so uh, we do work with uh, organizations like the World Health Organization, um, you know, others, uh, COVID-19 response. We work with uh, state and local governments, uh, school districts as well. Um, so certainly if you have a nonprofit, we'd love to talk to you, uh, understand better what your search experience looks like. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, organizations of all types and sizes have access to this kind of capability to deliver better user experiences. So please reach out. Any other questions from the, the chat earlier that we wanted to highlight? Anything else that people want to ask? Uh, let's see, I see the note from Katie. Uh, any content types uh, that are best for customers who don't want to engage in self-service? Um, videos, FAQs versus GIFs. Um, so let's see if I understand the question correctly. Any content types um, to be best for customers who don't want to engage in self-service? Um, so uh, maybe I, if you could rephrase the question, I'm, I'm, if I infer correctly, I think there are, uh, in our experience, most customers do want to have um, at least some ability to be able to resolve questions on their own. Um, in many cases, the content that's provided is often text driven, long form, um, and it's hard to digest. In some cases you're actually getting, you know, dozens of pages that you have to wade through. Um, I think a key element of that is, you know, being able to, um, identify where is that really nugget of knowledge that exists sometimes in that long form content and to be able to surface that up. And in some cases it's reformatting that information. Um, you know, that's another area where you can use the search analytics to be able to identify that you have the wrong content type available. Um, and so I think, but the other element of that is making sure that you can bring all of that information together uh, so you can understand, you know, which types of information are driving the most value. And then you can redirect your own resources to make those things better or invest in different parts of the, um, the content stack. Uh, do you offer solutions uh, on how to keep knowledge graphs current? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, exactly. I was actually just talking with a, a retail bank customer yesterday, as a matter of fact, and uh, the same question came up because you have some cases, regulatory requirements that are different by state um, uh, as well as just overall. So uh, one of the challenges that you, um, you know, will have to overcome is, you know, again, keeping that information uh, up to date. And then also if you're engaging in a support driven um, or uh, agent assisted experience, you know, that they have the correct information available as well. Um, and there's something that we didn't show a moment ago, I'll jump over to it. But uh, the idea is that the knowledge graph reflects the information that you have already. And so through the connectors, whether it's through an API, uh, through a, um, you can do a web crawl or do a, a pushed update if you want. Uh, but the idea is that the knowledge, inf uh, the knowledge graph content is constantly uh, current and reflective of what you have in the underlying systems. There is also the ability to manage knowledge directly inside the knowledge graph as well. So you know, that option is available. And the idea is that you can then uh, make sure that you know, any information that's being surfaced to customers or to uh, your uh, agents is accurate. Uh, well, I'll jump over and give a, a, another example of what that can look like. Whoop, let me go back here. Um, and so I wanted to talk about you know, this example of, you know, if I'm not sure you know, what information might be available, or if um, I'm not sure how to actually ask my question. Uh, this is a mock-up of just a, a telco um, sample help center, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and again, you can see the example where I've got, you know, information being surfaced in terms of like what kinds of things I could look for. But sometimes the issue is I'm not exactly sure how to phrase my question. Um, and so I'm saying, well, I'm just going to troubleshoot a problem. Um, keep in mind that this same context, um, we call this a guided search, it can be very valuable um, for a um, uh, agent experience as well. And so if I go through and I've got different kinds of options, now this might also be different states or different products um, or different types of solutions or offerings that I have. Uh, and so essentially I'm walking my way through to that piece of content that's going to be most relevant for my question. And so in this case, you know, I go through and I've got now a range of options um, that might be uh, applicable. So again, I'm kind of helping that user construct that question or helping an agent triage that issue, um, depending on what they've seen. So in this banking example, for instance, this would be about, you know, what product is it? What state do you live in? Um, you know, what uh, type of issue are you trying to resolve? And it can be a way to help me drill down to that uh, subset of information that would be most relevant. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the way that can be done. But uh, the idea is that you wanna make sure that, 
you're presenting different options for people to be able to navigate to the information they need. Um, and in some cases, that triage or troubleshooting model can be really effective. I hope that helps. All right. And see, you know, what, one very, uh, this is fit again, one very cool thing that I know many of the <clears throat> folks here on the call, they look at how to promote the article, make sure that the, uh, the appropriate articles at the top, they might pin it, et cetera. Um, but you take it a step further to provide that snippet in the article. Yeah. And using the knowledge graphs. You want to, can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, that's, thanks for bringing that one up, Martin. Absolutely. So when I come back over into like an answers experience, um, and so if I come over here, uh, and hopefully everybody can see my screen, uh, there's a lot of ability to do what we call shaping the experience. And that could include things like identifying, you know, what's the right kind of, um, you know, article or sorry, piece of content to promote. Um, our, the way our model works, um, you know, so we are built on uh, leveraging technologies like BERT and GPT-3. Uh, we train our models on the public internet nightly. So that's how we ensure accuracy right out of the box. So we're able to, uh, once we've connected um, content and brought it into the knowledge graph, we're really scanning and, and reviewing all of that information um, and letting the models do what they do in terms of being able to um, identify a piece of information. Um, and so if I come down here and you know, I'm looking at, you know, different pieces of content, the, uh, and I want to be able to say, hey, is this the right information to leverage the, um, like, I'll come down to this one. So uh, the algorithm will identify what it thinks is the right answer for that question. And so I can see the snippet, uh, but I can also then say, you know what, actually, I want to be able to shape that. I want to be able to slightly revise that because um, I want to make sure that I'm getting, you know, either the most current information or uh, if I might even have two different pieces of knowledge that are slightly related, I want to make sure that this is the most authoritative source. So I have the ability to do what we call humans in the loop. Um, and so I can take that information, shape it, and really deliver uh, what we believe, uh, what you believe as the content owner, as the experience owner, is going to drive the most uh, value. Um, obviously, there's all sorts of things you can do, too, around um, you know how you configure the verticals, the different types of content, what content gets surfaced first. Um, you know, There's a lot of ability to... Uh, also do what we call query rules. Um, so think of query rules as like an if this, then that. So depending on the kind of question somebody asked, you can then initiate another set of actions. Um, and that's the ability to then anticipate and really direct people to really resolving those issues most quickly. So if I think about query rules, you know, and it's uh, adding the criteria and the follow-up action. Again, it's just super straightforward. The idea is you want to make it simple for a support leader, um, an analyst, or a uh, a partner uh, in the customer experience team to be able to deploy these kinds of experiences, test them, see what's working, uh, but then also shape uh, the experience in a way that's really going to drive the best brand experience overall. Um, and this is just scratching the surface. There's a lot more uh, that we could show in terms of all the different ways that you can leverage the answers experience uh, and create multiple answers experiences, depending on personas, different types of users, different types of brands, et cetera. Right. Any more questions from folks? Looks like we got it. And right. actually, what would be great, you have a, a great library of little micro learnings for people to drill down. We can include that in the when we send out the recording and the presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me on that. We have a, our own uh, learning management system we built actually on top of the knowledge graph. It's called our Hitchhiker platform. Uh, and so we'll include a link to that as well. Uh, but the ability to um, really understand all the different nuances and capabilities of the knowledge graph. Um, you know, there's a lot to explore, but we also make it really accessible. Most of the people who are deploying this technology haven't worked with it before. Like I said, they're able to get up and running very quickly and realize payback periods, um, you know, very um, much faster than they've had with previous technologies. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions about any of this, uh, you can see the information here or in the chat. Uh, please visit yex.com slash support or yex.com slash demo if you want to see a, a get signed up for a, a, a custom demo of the experience or if you just want to dig in deeper, we're happy to show you more. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. And thank you, Gordon. Yeah. And thank you, Martin. Great, great to meet everybody on the call. Great to be part of the, the KCS Academy and the uh, consortium community. Really excited to collaborate with you all going forward. Great. All right. You all have a great day. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.